Welcome back. I hope you are having a really nice afternoon meeting new companies that can do business in photonics with you. If this was a live event, I would ask right now each and every one of you to raise your hand if you have already made an interesting business lead that you want to follow up. I think I feel that all of you are already raising the hand right now. In this keynote session, we are going to my favorite topic in the world. And anybody who knows me knows that this is quantum technologies. And we're going to one of the companies that is making a difference in the European industry. We are talking about a Trump subsidiary. And if Trump invests in quantum, is for a reason. Lasers are involved. We are going to Stuttgart to meet the CEO of Quant, Michael Forge. Thank you very much, Michael, for taking the keynote speech at this fantastic Photonics Plus event. I want to help you be even greater than you already are. And the supply chain of 700 Epic members are here with me. The floor and the attention of everyone on this global event goes to Stuttgart, goes to Michael Forge, goes to Quant. Thank you very much, Jose. This was, the, I think it was the most enthusiastic announcement I had in all these digital times. Thank you very much for this. So um, yeah, today I, I want to give you some insights on quantum technology and what photonics means to this quantum technology. But before we start talking about photonics, uh, we can skip photonics for a second and uh, have a look uh, what exactly does quantum technology mean? And uh, in this diagram, okay, it's part in German, but I guess everyone gets the message. Um, it, physicists tend to divide the world into different models. And depending on how fast you are and how big you are, um, different uh, models have to be used in order to explain nature. And if you're looking to quantum technology, it's based on quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics describes everything which is rather slow, but super tiny. So we are talking about um, how atoms are interacting, how photons are interacting among each other, how ions are interacting. So this is what quantum technology is all about. It's um, basically exploiting quantum mechanics. And um, the question then what automatically pops up is quantum technology new? And are technologies based on quantum mechanics something that surprises in the 21st century? And I must say, well, no, it's not. Um, one of the biggest maybe game changers of the 20th century, the semiconductor, is a clear quantum, um, quantum mechanical phenomena. So the first calculations are based on quantum mechanics and uh, they basically led that uh, the invention of the semiconductor was possible and without any doubts, the semiconductor, I think there is hardly to find a technology that disrupted the 20th century other than uh, comparably like the semiconductor. And it's still doing this and it's not stopping. The second um, invention, which was also made in the 20th century, and it, of course, Jose already mentioned it, we are a subsidiary of Trump. Uh, so um, we are proud to say, yes, we are exploiting quantum technology of the first generation, so to say, um, as well by uh, using the laser. At Trump, we are using this for sheet metal cutting, but um, you might all know, since you're the photonic expert, that the laser is a common uh, tool in many industries, ranging from telecom to diagnostics and yeah, ending a sheet metal cutting. And, and this is all about quantum technology of the first generation. Now, I already said first generation. When there is a first generation, there is usually a second generation. And, but what's the difference? In a very simple picture, really, in a very simple picture. Um, you can compare quantum technology of the first century, so the semiconductor and the laser, like a tap, a water tap and water. You basically can control the jet of water, but you cannot control the individual water droplets. Now, the quantum technology of the second generation, what we are currently um, tr um, starting to exploit, it's more like controlling the individual water droplets of this jet of water. This is just an alanogon, but it gives you an idea how precise things have to be controlled in order to exploit this noble phenomena. What are we expecting from this change? Well, um, there are four major industry fields. It's communication, it's sensing and measuring, it's vision and imaging, and it's computation and simulation. And these four technology fields, they will experience disruptive changes by exploiting novel quantum phenomena. Um, 
due to uh, getting better control over quantum mechanics. And what are these phenomena? Well, there are mainly three which we are exploiting. It's superposition. Some of you might know it as is the cat dead or, a, or alive. It's this Schrodinger cat example. Then there is the uncertainty relation that you cannot measure two variables um, at ultimate precision. So it's always this, this, this speed and, 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 and place where you are. Um, you can either tell how fast an atom is traveling, but then you're not exactly knowing where it is or you know where it is precisely, but then it's on the cost of the information on the velocity. Um, one, uh, one remark, this only accounts for rather massless objects and doesn't apply for speed control or something like this. So it's, it's really, it, it's dedicated for small objects, this uncertainty relation. And the last, um, uh, or one, uh, the, the third um, quantum phenomena which we are getting now access to is entanglement. It means that two quantum objects, so for example, two atoms or two photons, are sharing the same information at the same time. So they are basically described by the same for the expert wave functions. And uh, this is mainly used, for example, currently for quantum computing. Yeah, now we do not have the time to look into all these four fields. But um, let me uh, spend some words on quantum communication as it is the main topic which is currently addressed in the public press. What's the value proposition? Why is everybody um, crazy about getting quantum computing to work? Again, a very simple diagram, but if we, if we consider um, our present technology, if we want to perform more complicated simulations, what can we do? Well, on the one side, we can um, increase the calculation speed by um, developing even faster hardware. This is something that's described by Moore's law that we are getting faster and faster um, semiconductor devices by integrating even more um, elements on the same footprint. And uh, to me, there is not really um, an end to this race. The semiconductor um, industry is evolving very, very good here and doing an excellent job here in order to yet increase the, the calculation um, density um, uh, every 18 months. The other thing is um, you can think about, scratch your head, uh, think about how you can solve your problem and develop better algorithms. But that basically is what, you, what your main tools are in order to increase your calculation speed. And if you ask me, this will still be working on a classical computing as we uh, experience computers nowadays, even for the next 100 years. The question is, which problems do we want to solve? And there are problems out there um, for the experts. They're called NP-hard problems. There are problems which are unsolvable using classical computing. It's just the way how classical computers calculate things makes those problems not um, calculatable by um, classical computers. So it's not that it, this job cannot be done by zeros and ones, you need qubits. Um, examples here are, for example, um, protein uh, developments where quantum objects are interacting with each other. And this problem can really only be solved by using a quantum computer. But there is another, there's what I here added as transition problems. These are problems which can either be calculated by optimized classic computers, or they can be calculated by uh, quantum computers. And the question is, which of the two systems can do it more efficiently in terms of speed, in terms of energy consumption? And this is where most of the current use cases are being addressed nowadays. And this is where a lot of um, unsolved problems are still existing. And the value proposition of the quantum computer is quite high. So this was just a general overview of quantum computing. Um, now, I, you remember I arranged these fields um, in an atom shape. And I did this on purpose because um, there is something, how, there's the question, how do we get basically to, re, to realize novel applications in these four fields, communication, vision, sensing, and, and computation. And the key here is to perfectionize and improve on our enabling technologies. And these enabling technologies, they not, are not necessarily quantum at least not quantum of the second generation. This can be an even better laser and more miniaturized laser. This can be diffractic optical elements. This can be um, photonics wave guides. There is a lot of photonics in this enabling technology uh, sector, which we need in order to realize quantum technologies of the second generation. 
where are we currently? If we're looking down on a technology readiness roadmap, everything typically starts with basic research and the interest growth and growth because the nature publication is yet, it's, it's, it's close to be published. And then uh, there is usually a, a decline um, in the interest of certain topics. And we are just at this, at this border where um, the topics which have been perfectly explored in academia and fundamental science which are declining because of uh, it's not new. It, it needs to be engineered in order to turn those things into products, for example, by novel enabling technologies to perfectionize lasers, electronics, and so on and so forth. And currently, we are what then often is referred to in literature of the valley of death, that um, those ideas are just uh, not continued because on the one side, the market seems to be far away. And on the other hand, um, scientists are losing interest. And there is a change in um, in key parameters that make those uh, things interesting. So while the academic side is usually talking about, I want to be the first, I want to perform a hero experiment, the machines or the, the apparatus has only been controlled by one PhD student or at least a small group of experts. It is designed and tailored to a budget that you give to the scientists and uh, the, the outcome is a hiring channel. Industry talks about how scalable is the product. Um, what is the user benefit of this? Is it fitting into the markets um, in terms of costs and what exactly is the profit for the company? And to fill this gap, this is exactly where we started to transfer um, quantum technology from the laboratories into products. And we're doing this with photonics at Quant. Um, initially already mentioned, we were founded in 2018 uh, in July um, as, a, as the 77th subsidiary of Trump um, with a dedicated focus uh, to use photonics in order to transfer quantum technology from the laboratory to products. Um, our vision is to revolutionize the quality, how machines analyze the environment, people notice information and the way human think and interact with machines. So what you can see from this statement, we're at the moment mainly focusing on data processing. So getting information in form of sensors and performing calculations on this. Now, how does a typical product, what, what do you basically have to expect if you come to our company, how are products looking like? On the next slide, this is an insight. Um, disclaimer first, this product, we have never developed this product. Um, it's just a mock-up, but it explains nicely what our core competitions are. So we're, as explained, we're um, carrying out photonics. We're exploiting photonics in order to address quantum uh, technologies, quantum mechanics, for example, um, to create superposition states. We are doing this on the photonics level, on the light level. Um, and then we're uh, getting information. So everything starts with electron to photon conversion. Electron to photon conversion means every photon that's generated must be the right photon because it's really, it's that simple. If you start with uh, not perfectly defined uh, um, laser beams, uh, you're not ending up with the perfect sensor as an example. These photons then are uh, then carried on to the quantum control sector. This is where the quantum magic or the quantum trick happens. So for example, here the superposition states are generated or the entangled states, but this is also the zone where um, the environment interacts with the quantumness. So for example, if we have a quantum sensor, this is also the area where, as an example, we have a particle sensor, which I'm going to show you later. This is where the particles are interacting with the superposition state. And so to say, encode their information on the quantum state. Now, everything is encoded in photonics, which is nice for us, but rather not appreciated by our customers. This is why we need to reconvert it back into electrons and data. And this is our thirst, uh, third um, uh, field of experience is the photon to electron conversion. Here, you can also do a lot of things not correct or wrong. Um, just uh, if you're not an expert on, for example, low noise amplifier systems, you can mess it up when you go from analog to digital. And if you do the signal processing at its own, because you need to understand the signatures which are imprinted on the signals and then forwarded on the analog electronic signals. Um, so this gives a, a, a rough idea what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you see from this picture, beside the photon to electron conversion at the second stage, a lot of photonics is in these boxes. 
to give you more insights, what have we done in our first three years? Um, we developed several laser systems on our own, which are dedicated, tailored to the products which they will um, realize. Um, you see here four, uh, three different wavelengths. Um, so for example, the 520 nanometer um, light source is dedicated for magnetometers. The 405 nanometer light is dedicated for um, generating entangled states. And the 795 nanometer light is dedicated to uh, realize an atomic gyroscope. Um, so, and as you see from the size, everything is miniaturized, it's packaged, um, it's small, uh, and it's uh, dedicated to a single purpose. Um, on the quantum control sector, we uh, this is just an example of one of our recent developments. We developed our own platform for nonlinear waveguides, which are based on lithium niobate and isolator. This is in order to, on the one side, route photons, light from A to B, control it and manipulate it by phase gates. And third, uh, it's also to generate um, the, the, the down converted light, which then breaks one photon into two photons, which is entangled. And on the on the lower picture, you can see that um, the silicon waveguides they're directly um, basically bonded on a silicon substrate, which makes them super integratable later on once it comes to the miniaturization. And in the third sector, uh, we developed our own electronic toolbox. Um, that's um, if you can think about it like a modular toolbox, where a lot of um, effort was spent on realizing low noise detectors and detection system, trans impedance, amplifier, and, and, and more. Right, now what have we realized? Or what are we currently realizing? I, I have two examples from our um, broad uh, technology roadmap uh, with me in this presentation. The first one is atomic sensors. It's an atomic sensor as a magnetometer. And uh, the value proposition of this is uh, what we are targeting is, it, it, I, well, I like it very much, I must say. It's part of uh, the QSense cluster, which is a future cluster of the German government, uh, which we recently successfully um, released here in Stuttgart area, uh, where 17 companies are participating in five universities in order to realize um, on the one, it's an application driven mm -hmm. cluster. So there is an application and the application which we are pursuing in this cluster is, we want to control exoskeletons by analyzing the magne magnetic field, which is created by the neurons in your body. So the, the use case is rather simple. Today, the exoskeleton control is not fail, uh, is, is, is basically, it's not fail safe. And uh, the patients which suffer from the, uh, these exoskeletons, basically they can control their exoskeletons at a percentage of 80 to 85%. Meaning in 15% uh, of the cases where you try to think something, your exoskeleton just does not react or doesn't do what you expect uh, the exoskeleton should do. And uh, this is one of the, 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 the highlights we were, where we're collaborating here with the University of Stuttgart and, and Berlin. Um, to realize a magnetic field sensor that picks up the, the neuronal signals of your body and then leads to control this exoskeleton. Um, what goes into such a sensor? Um, well, again, on this mock-up level, uh, we need a dedicated source electron to photon. I already highlighted it. That is a special uh, laser um, which uh, generates light at 520 nanometer and it's super low noise current driver um, because every noise or every um, deviation from the ideal uh, laser will automatically lead to um, um, a worse signal. Then on the quantum control sector, um, here we need to go on the microwave uh, implementation and uh, we need to implement as well a bias field. But in addition, this is done while using a diamond. The diamond comes from one of our um, collaborators we address it wire light and do the photonics and the microwave integration. And now this, you have to think about this diamond uh, is basically pumped in the green and generating photons in the red. The red photons are directly corresponding to what exactly your body was thinking in terms of what the motion should be. And this then is picked up by our electronics um, and by our photo detectors and electronics is amplified and data processed. 
what is the, the idea behind this? Yeah, we know there are magnetometers out there, but the targets or the, the, the key specs of the system is that it's first of all, it has be it, it will be operatable at room temperature. We do not need any kind of cryogenics in there. It will be a super small footprint, um, more on the size of uh, five by five by five um, centimeters at least. And the sensitivity will be smaller than that 10 picotesla. Now the last 10 picotesla, it's that small that you can pick up the neural actions, the magnetic field, which is uh, related to this neuron action. This is so to say the threshold and this is what we are targeting. And the last uh, few minutes, I'm approaching the end. Um, I want to highlight the particle sensor, which we recently um, announced publicly together with SIG. What's the idea behind this? Um, you might believe it or not, particle sensing is almost everywhere. Uh, most of industries are using particle sensors, as example here, food and beverage. Um, and it, at the moment, it's quite common that you do manual probing. So there is an operator that puts some of the, the powder that uh, he or she wants to analyze into a machine and characterizes the powder quality. Now, this in the in nowadays where everything is digital and uh, and, and industry 4.0 is more or less everywhere is a, is a still to be optimizable process this is the idea behind the sensor and the sensor uh, is using you can see it on the next slide is using superposition position states of light but why are we using this um, the main uh, advantage of using this is that we increase the data space instead of other sensors which are analyzing the size, we are analyzing the size, the speed, the direction, and we can analyze the particle shape in one single shot. And if this increases the data space by a factor, you can say four or even more, and gives automatically more access to real, -time data, real life data models, um, which then can be used to optimize industrial processes. The sensor as well works in liquid and in gases. It's, uh, it, it, can, it will deliver in real time uh, feedback on the control process. Now, something that's not very intuitive, or maybe you, you would say, wow, this is, I haven't thought that this is true. Um, quantum technology features here that it's getting insensitive to harsh and polluted environments. And the last thing is not a quantum feature, but uh, it's basically up on our customer request. Um, we can customize the software, but as, uh, and as well the hardware interface to the processes of the customers. And on the last slide, I just want to show you what's possible now with the sensor. You see basically one of the customers was asking us, can you distinguish whether there's a single droplet going through our ethereal sensor, whether two so a coincidence is going through the sensor or if the two particles are sticking together. And uh, due to this increased data space, we trained an artificial or a neuronal network. And what you can see is the measurement results here. We clearly can distinguish between these three levels. We can also distinguish whether a particle was elliptical shaped or round. And this now is directly feed forward to that we can set, uh, do cell analytics and uh, therefore help the bio industry um, to get better control over the cell uh, growth. With this, I'm approaching the end. I know I'm a bit, I took a bit le longer, but I hope it was worth to talking about this. And um, I don't know if, if allowed, I would be very happy to, to get some questions. Thank you very much for a fantastic discussion. Can I ask you to stop sharing the screen so I can see you the way that you deserve? Uh, it is, uh, yeah, just click on the sharing screen button and just deactivate. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much for a great presentation. My first question comes on the lithium niobite because I'm a huge fan of that. You're using silicon waveguides with lithium niobite modulators on top. And that is a technology that are, we are very interested in pushing. Do you have uh, some, some problems in the supply chain? Can you get this in, because in the future you're going to need volume production of that. Can you get this or is there anything that the EPIC community can do to help you uh, with the supply of lithium niobite technology on silicon? Um. Contact me, I'm open to discuss here um, and uh, we are also open to share parts of this uh, value chain. Currently, we're basically buying silicon and we're buying uh, lithium niobate wafers 
and that's what we are basically supplying from our customers but uh yeah from our uh from yeah not from our customers but from from our suppliers and then we do the full process integration on our own at the moment but as you can imagine um once it comes to a uh, large scale production um there might be smarter ways to 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 develop the complete stack yeah. Uh, there is a there is a pilot line for manufacturing uh, lithium elevator silicon photonics coming from CSEM in Switzerland. They are looking for pilot customers, so I will be first introducing mm -hmm. you to them because it's an obvious cooperation. I also would like to introduce you to somebody very special for me. He's my mm -hmm. mentor on laser technology, innovation manager at Epic, Antonio Raspa, 30 years experience in the laser industry, worked at Trump for many, many years. Antonio, did you know already what Trump has invested on quantum technologies? Yes, yes, I heard how much they invested and I know that this is really at the top level of uh, attention in Trump. And yeah, here really there is a, a lot to discuss, but uh, if you can just tell something about uh, the laser, I saw a laser at uh, 520, just uh, a short comment because then we will have the time to talk long, very long about. Um, you mean what type of laser this is? Um, it's a, a butterfly package laser, um, which is operated frequency stabilized. It reaches around um, 0.1 picometer stabilization um, and delivers an output power, depending on whether it's fiber coupled or not, between 50 to more than 100 milliwatt. So yeah. this, this is basically, the, the good thing here is um, a, in terms of frequency stabilization, um, it's not that important. Um, it's not compared to atomic transitions. Um, the NV center um, is not that, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not that demanding than other atomic systems are. It's more important that uh, you can control it. And this is the main feature that you can control the electronics driver that you did or that your noise floor is close to shot noise. Because whatever is um, exceeding or what is excess noise brought into in, uh, due to instabilities in the laser onto the laser signal is automatically picked up by the uh, by, by the diamond, and this will lead to to noise in your um, um, in in your signal and automatically um, the uh, your sensitivity will decline. Okay, great, really a great presentation, and uh, I think that uh, as soon as possible to start traveling, uh, I will go. First to, to your company before the truth, where I work it so long. But I come first <laughs> to you, really. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And really, uh, I invite everybody maybe to make a quick visit to the exhibition, and then we are here back in uh, three minutes. <laughs>